This is the fifth session on the children of Abraham. So we have really been getting into some rich information and some deep information on what it is to be children of Abraham. And as a means of review, let's go back to the foundational scripture. It's Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. This says, know that those who are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And incidentally, if you do not have an outline, my wife can get you one. There is a couple up front. And if you don't have one, you certainly need one to follow along with it. Uh, those that are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Say that with me. Say, those who are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And so the key element, the crux of the matter is walking in faith. And if you walk in faith, then the blessing of Abraham is passed to you. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might pass on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. And I've often said that if Jesus thought it was worth becoming a curse, becoming a curse, so that we might receive the blessing of Abraham. It behooves us to understand what that blessing is. And if you ask the ordinary Christian what the blessing of Abraham is, most likely they have absolutely no idea. But if Jesus thought it was worth absolutely assuming the curse of the entire human race so that the blessing of Abraham can come upon us, then I want to know what that is. Amen, can I get an amen in the house? Now, uh, uh, for those of you that have not been a part of this ongoing study in this particular area, we have found out that there are 16 different facets. There are 16 different facets to the blessing of Abraham. And we've covered quite a few. We're actually on number 10. And uh, again, as a means of review, I'll go over some of the others. Uh, the first one, God said, I will bless you. Second, I will make your name great. Third, you shall be a blessing. Fourth, I will bless those who bless you. Fifth, I will curse those who curse you. Sixth, in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Seven, in, you, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Number eight, I am your shield. And number nine, I am your exceedingly great reward. And now we're at number 10 where he said, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit audacious. Uh, how could a human being talk to God this way? But I think he understands where you're coming from. Would you lift your hand right now and say, make me, Lord. Go ahead. Just make me. Make me whatever you want me to be. I am surrendered. I am clay in your hands. Mold me. Shape me. I surrender to your Lordship and your pottery mastership, your masterful way of taking a lump of mere clay and shaping it into a vessel filled with your glory. He said, I will make you not just fruitful, but I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Can you believe God for that? Can you believe God for exceptional fruit that exceeds the norm? That's what God said he would do for you. I think it's interesting to see that God's first command to man, once Adam and Eve were created, his very first mandate for them was be fruitful. Be fruitful. Part of being a human being is the call to fruitfulness. And of course, that's fulfilled on many, many levels. And I'm appalled, and I'm sure God is very appalled at the uh, enormous amount of people in the body of Christ that really have no vision, no passion to increase the kingdom, to advance the kingdom, to bear fruit in this world, but just to barely get by so that they can slip in the door of heaven. And, and that's not what this journey is all about. This journey is not just about somehow surviving until the day you go to heaven. This journey is all about thriving while you're here and advancing God's kingdom by producing fruit. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowls of heaven and all animals that move upon the earth. And so fruitfulness and multiplication go together. 
That's how you increase. You increase by multiplying your faith in others. Now, of course, on the foundational level, that's talking about natural offspring. And uh, that's the sign of the blessing of God. Offspring, children are the sign of the blessing of God. So Darlene's one of the most blessed people in this room. Uh, I forget how many you have, but you are blessed indeed. And uh, God said uh, to Abraham, and, and this is the amazing thing, he didn't have a child yet by Sarah. And, and God said, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And then he told him, nations will come of you and kings will come out of you. And I'll make your seed like the stars of the heaven, like the uh, dust of the earth. And I, I believe there's a, uh, an analogy there because we are like the dust of the earth in our physical frame. But once we're glorified, we'll be like the stars of heaven shining in the firmament. They that turn many to righteousness shall shine like the firmament and like the stars forever and forever. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward, or is a reward. And so one of the ways God rewards you is with children. Um, sometimes I wonder if he's rewarding some of the stuff I did bad. <laughs> you know, when I was a teenager, not really, I'm just teasing. Uh, but he says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Now, and, and the amazing thing about it is this, this uh, miracle of procreativity. That uh, God set it up so that you and I can participate with him in the process of creating new human beings. And to be honest with you, I think part of the production or part of the creation of the soul is the union of the man and the woman's soul at conception because there are certain uh, personality traits that are replicated in children and grandchildren. You see it passed down through the family line. And sometimes you see it surface in children's lives even when they're separate from the parent and then several years later they come together and see similar kind of traits. And so uh, I tend to believe that there's some kind of strange way that God allows the soul to be the product of the conception process, and then the spirit comes from God who gives it. Uh, I'm not sure how all that works, but I do know the mystery of the matter is that we can participate in bringing forth this miracle, this expression of genius called another human being. Now, God could do it all by himself. He did it all by himself with Adam and, and Eve to begin with. But he wants us to have a part. And in like manner, God could produce all the fruit for the kingdom of God that needs to be produced in this world. He could save everyone by himself. He could appear supernaturally in a dream to everyone who needs to be saved or would be responsive to him and accept his salvation grace. But he wants us to participate in the process. He could have opened the Red Sea without Moses stretching forth his rod but he wanted Moses to participate in this supernatural deliverance. He could have easily brought down the Philistine army without Samson flinging a jawbone around his head, but he wanted Samson to participate in this demonstration of power and of might that brought down the enemy. And in like manner, would you lift your hand right now and say he wants me to participate? He wants me. A good father doesn't want to do everything for his children because he knows they'll never mature and reach their full potential if he does. God is the same way. He wants to make you exceedingly fruitful. Now, fruit falls into a number of different categories. And remember, uh, fruit is an expression of the life of the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Quote that with me, please. That's John 15, uh, 1. Everyone say, I am the vine, I am the vine. and you are the branches. That's 15, uh, John 15, 5. Well, I want you to notice that the life sap that flows through the vine flows through the branches also. So it's the same life sap. And the life sap relates to the nature of God as contained in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the expression of the character of God. And so the same character that flowed through the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his attributes and all of his abilities is the life sap that flows through you. 
I wonder what kind of incredible potential is within the heart of every person in this place. First, we have the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. People get excited about the gifts of the Spirit, but they don't get excited about the fruit of the Spirit quite as much. And yet, Jesus launched his ministry without a reference at all to the gifts of the Spirit. He didn't say, blessed are those who talk in tongues, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who heal the sick, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who prophesy, for they shall be uh, awesome in the sight of heaven. He, didn't, he, he never even mentioned any of the supernatural gifts, but he started off with things like meekness and poverty of spirit and and a repentant attitude, mourning over your sins, and, and then hungering after righteousness, and, and working peace in the lives of others. It really is important. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness or kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Have you ever seen a tree eat its own fruit? Have you ever walked through an apple orchard and when no one was looking, the tree gobbled up one of its own apples. Of course not. How absurd. Uh, and the point is this. So many people think, well, I've got joy in God, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I, I, I want this joy for the sake of my own heart. I've got to conquer depression, so I want to awaken this joy. With it. It's not for you. If you're bearing fruit, the bearing of fruit is not for you, the bearing of fruit is so that you can find somebody else depressed and make them joyful. So that you can find somebody else anxious and make them peaceful. So that you can find someone else who's in need of these character traits in their life. And you can infuse their hearts with it by ministering to them and influencing them. Can I get an amen in the room? The next, another kind of fruit is the fruit of religious works or spiritual works in your life. Souls being brought into the kingdom of God. Uh, again, I, I, I'm often appalled at how little passion so many Christians have to win the loss. When I first got saved, I considered every day that passed by that I did not win a soul into the kingdom as a wasted day. That's my quota. I try, and my kids don't even like to ride with me in the car because they know if I go to a gas station to fill up with gas and if the convenience store is run by a Hindu, dad will be in there for a half hour. <laughs> Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's our main focus. It's, if we're Christians, it's the first command God gave Adam is the first command he gives you. You're saved now? Okay, be fruitful. Multiply. Multiply your faith in others. Multiply your trust toward God in others. Praise God. Well, the fruit of religious works, we've got a number of scriptures there. John 4, 36 says, He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. He who reaps receives wages. What does that mean? That you get paid off when you win souls. What's my pay? The joy of increasing the body of Christ, the blessing. The Bible said God would increase the joy of, like the joy of harvest for us. And then John 12, 24, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Dies. Dies. You mean I've got to die to stuff in order to bring forth fruit? Yeah, die to television so you invest that time in the kingdom more. Die to entertainment, so instead you become a warrior and a soldier in the army of the Lord. Die to some things that are not necessarily sinful, but they're time robbers. They're time robbers. I wrote a poem years ago called Time. Time, what a mystery. It is both friend and foe. It causes us to age, yet enables us to grow. Time, what a challenge. It is both future and past. The one cannot be changed, the other will come at last. So time, there's only one element of you that I can seize. Tis the moment, tis the present. So I bow upon my knees to the Lord of time and pray that he will grant to me 
to do within time's boundaries what will last eternally. That's the cry of my heart. So let's die to something. Die, find something you can die to that will make you alive to the purpose of God. Because that's the thing, God is the great equalizer and you don't die to what is a time robber without God making you alive to what is a time filler. Something that will fill your time and produce good fruit for the kingdom. Uh, John 15, 2, every branch in me, and this one disturbs me. I kind of like to bypass this scripture sometimes because it's just too strong. And I say that tongue in cheek. He starts out saying, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman and every branch in me. Everybody say in me. In me. He's talking about people that are in union with him. They're saved people. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And everyone that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bring forth more fruit. So have you been through any kind of pruning stage? Pruning means stuff gets cut away from you. Things that you depend on, dead branches that are just weighing you down, but you don't want to separate yourself from them because you're so used to those dead branches being there. Is this speaking to anybody's heart? He, he prunes it so that more life can be produced. That's why you prune uh, something to get rid of the dead and non-bearing parts and, and give, uh, well, you've got to have a cut, a slice, so that l a burst of life can come forth. Well, I'm claiming a burst of life for me and for every one of you. And I love this, John 15, 8. In this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. The sign of a true disciple is real fruit in that person's life. Real results uh, of the indwelling of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word disciple is found, what, 256 times in the Bible? We like to refer to ourselves as believers, that's found twice. Christians, that's found three times. Saints, that's found 100 and 101 times. But we rarely refer to ourselves as disciples. Who are you? What are you? I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's too close to the word discipline for comfort. Because if we say, I am a disciple, we're automatically placing upon ourselves this heavy responsibility of discipline so that we can bring forth much fruit for the Father's glory. Praise God. And then John 15, 16 opens up a whole new world of thought to me. He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have chosen you. So if he has chosen you, he must really see a potential in you and a value in you and a and a long-lasting relationship with you that he wants to preserve, he wants to lay claim to and seal and protect and nurture. And he saw that in you before you saw it in yourself. I am valuable to God. You are valuable to God. Come on, say that with me. Say, I am valuable to God. Or he never would have chosen me. And the thing about God, he's omniscient. And so he chose you knowing every mistake you would ever make after you got saved. And I know some of you feel like I'm just disqualified now because this has happened or that has happened in my life. God never would have saved you to begin with if that was going to disqualify you. He knew in the beginning. That's why he provided redemptive blood. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. The word ordained simply means to be set in divine order, predestined, predetermined. People get all scared if you use the word predestined. They think it's fatalism. But know that uh, it's a fact of life. Even in your natural body, there are certain things that are predestined. Uh, if you've got green eyes, you can wish the rest of your life you had blue eyes, but it's in the genes. It's in the chromosomes for you to have blue eyes, and you can't change it. It's predestined. And uh, if it's in the genes for you to have brown hair, you cannot have blonde hair. Don't look at me defiantly, ladies. I know you can make it blonde for a season, but you can't permanently make it blonde. The roots will come out after a while. And Jesus even said, you can't, by thought, add one cubit to your stature. A cubit is a foot and a half. And I found out Jesus was right, because I tried. When I was a kid, I used to think my way to six feet. Well, it never happened. It, because the maximum potential in the genes 
was five foot eight and a half. When you're down this low, you claim every half inch you can. Uh, so I have no control over this, but I have full control over this. So in the same human body, part of it is uncontrollable and part of it is fully up to your control. And that's the way life is. There's a mixture. Some things God predestines and it's irreversible, unchangeable, inevitable. God forecasts it. He foreordains it. And then other things, there's a mixture of the free will of man involved. If it weren't that way, then we would be mere puppets, and we're not puppets. But God also undergirds us. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and that's a love with no beginning and no end. He says, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that your fruit should remain. Say that with me, please. That your fruit should remain. So the sign that it's really fruit from the Spirit of God's influence in your life is that it has stay in power. It has power to remain eternally. And that's good to know, that your fruit should remain. That whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So fruit bearing goes along with intimacy with God. The more fruit you bear, the more you've got the ear of God, apparently by this particular passage. You've not chose me. And, and something else about it is he indicates that he's the author. He's the originator. He's the initiator. He's the one that chooses you. And then he empowers you to bear fruit. And then he turns around and rewards you when you do bear fruit. But it was all him to start with. Paul said, I labored more abundantly than all the other disciples. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And then he turns around and says, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But he just told me it wasn't him, it was the grace of God with him that did the works. But God's still going to reward you. Isn't that a good God? Isn't that a good God that graces you to do something for him and then rewards you because you do it when it was all him to start with? And then finally, the last kind of fruit is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. It says, therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice, everybody say sacrifice, a praise to God, the King James, I believe, says continually uh, after praise to God. Therefore, by him, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, I have a few little pet peeves religiously, and one of them is when people get up and say, I know you've had a hard day today, but you know, the Bible says... We need to give God a sacrifice of praise. And I know it's a real sacrifice for some of y'all to live one hand halfway up and whisper out a hallelujah, but sacrifice with me. It's not a sacrifice to worship God. It is a privilege to worship God. It is not a sacrifice to lift holy hands. It is an honor to lift holy hands because my hands would be defiled and unholy had God not cleansed me with the blood that was shed on Calvary. So it's not a sacrifice in that sense. It's not a sacrifice in the sense of being a self-denial to worship God. Oh, this is such a struggle. Hallelujah. That's not what he meant. A sacrifice was something, number one, that was the best you had. You would never bring a sacrifice to the altar that was maimed or uh, lame or some kind of diseased condition. That would be an insult to God. You were to bring the first and the best to God. Everybody say the first and the best. Well, the sacrifice of praise should be the best we can possibly offer to him without any kind of defilement. Any kind of sacrifice placed on an altar uh, must be without blemish. That was the requirement. That was the prerequisite. And we blemish our praise when we mix it with unbelief and mix it with depression and mix it with discouragement and half-hearted attitude. Then it's defiled. It is not without blemish then. So if we bring them a sacrifice of praise, make sure our hearts are pure and passionate. We prepared our heart to seek God and we prepare the way of the Lord so that before we come to the sanctuary, we're ready for worship. We're ready for worship. And then something else about a sacrifice, especially when they first started, literal fire fell from heaven and consumed 
the sacrifice on the altar at the dedication of Moses' tabernacle. And they were commanded to keep that fire burning so that any sacrifice that was laid on that altar was consumed with fire that came from heaven. And so God is saying, if you're going to give me a sacrifice of praise, human emotion is not enough. Human emotion is insufficient. It's got to be fire from above. Come on, somebody lift your hands and ask God for fire from above. We need fire from above, Lord. Hallelujah. We need an invasion in this sanctuary of holy fire that fell on Pentecost. And the fire's been kept burning ever since. That's what a sacrifice of praise is all about. Next, the 11th blessing of Abraham is a royal seed. He said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, this is right when he gave him the covenant of circumcision and, and, and he, circumcised, uh, uh, he circumcised Ishmael, his son, by Hagar, and then Abraham was circumcised. And right after that is when Isaac was conceived. And uh, during that visitation, God also told Abram, or Abraham as his name was changed to, that kings will come out of you. Now this blessing has been fulfilled literally and figuratively because many literal kings have descended from Abraham, but on a higher level, all the spiritual seed of Abraham are kings. You're all royal. You are the royal seed of God. Think of yourself that way, the royal seed of God. I love Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, and who was that one? Adam. If by one man's offense death reigned by one, or through the one, much more, everybody say much more. Much more. Much more. I, I've preached a whole sermon on those two words, much more. There's key scriptures all through the New Testament that contain the words much more. For if by one man's uh, offense, death reigned. So death reigned over the human race. You come into the world spiritually dead. It works its way into your soul through all the experiences of your life. Your spirit is dead at birth. Your soul isn't really that contaminated yet. You haven't had time to have experiences in life. But then the more negative experiences you have in life, the more death works its way into your soul. Negative emotions and negative thoughts and ideas and concepts. And then it works its way into your body until death just envelops you. And then if someone walks through this world and dies without God, the ultimate end is the second death. And so death reigns over them eternally, both soul and body in the lake of fire. Death reigns. But the Bible goes on to say those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by, through, one, through the one Jesus Christ. And so the two elements that give us the ability to flip this thing around and instead of this world reigning over us with death, we reign in life. And the Amplified Version says we reign as kings in life. And the way we do that is through the abundance of grace. I call grace God's one way or the other plan. Let me go through that again. Grace is God's one way or the other plan. Because one way or the other, God's going to get you through this mess by grace. The first thing grace does is teach you and empower you to live a clean life. I don't believe grace was ever given so that we could get by with sin but be delivered from sin. And to Titus, uh, these words were written. The grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so grace is a teacher. And the first thing it teaches us is to live a godly life. And it empowers us to live a godly life. The grace of God is divine empowerment, divine enablement to live above sin. But if by chance you falter and fall and fall flat on your face, grace changes its face. And instead of being divine empowerment to live above sin, it becomes unmerited love to recover from sin. And so one way or the other, everybody say one way or the other, grace is going to get you through. Grace is going to get you through. Praise God. And uh, that's why it can be two things. It can be unmerited love. It can be divinely imparted ability. And all God asks of you is the three requirements to have grace flowing in your life. And that's faith. By grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Humility. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. 
The previous was Ephesians 2.8, and then 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And finally, Ephesians 6.24, grace be with all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And as long as you're sincerely in love with the Lord, willing to humble yourself, and you keep on believing with a headstrong attitude, you believe in the cross, you believe in the blood, you believe in the open tomb, then somehow, some way, grace is going to connect with you and push you through an army of demonic opposition against you. And like David, you'll run through a troop and leap over a wall and make it all the way. Well, that's not the only thing that makes us reign as kings in life. The other, uh, the other thing accented in this scripture is the gift of righteousness. It's hard for people to get their mind wrapped around the fact that in Christianity, righteousness is not something you do, it's something you receive. And you do as an act of gratitude for what you received. Because I could never, if I spent my whole life working religious works, I could never attain the same level of righteousness that I received as a free gift when I was saved. Because when I was saved, I became all the way up here, the righteousness of God in Christ. You can't improve on that. You can't become any more righteous than being the righteousness of God in Christ. And here I am, a religious person down here that thinks, well, I've got to fast, I've got to pray, I've got to deny myself here, I've got to deny myself there. I'm working my way up this mountain to try and achieve a status of righteousness. I might get halfway there by human effort when immediate upon faith, I was taken all the way there. Well, why should I live right then as an act of worship to God? Psalm 29 says, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is ugly when we use it for the purpose of establishing our own righteousness. Holiness is beautiful when we use it as a means of worshiping God. He said, worship God in the beauty of holiness. Learn that and it will free up your soul to just walk in a love relationship with God. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. This is not a futuristic promise because Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And I tell this to people sometimes and I, you folks have heard me say it many times, so it's no shock to you. But in some churches, they've never heard this. And when I mention your ultimate goal is not heaven, they look at me with utter shock and awe. He didn't say what I think he just said, did he? No, your ultimate goal is not heaven. Your ultimate goal is ruling and reigning on the earth. That's why he's going to gather his elect from the four winds of heaven, from the four corners of heaven, rather and bring them with him when he returns because he's setting up his kingdom on the earth and Jerusalem of all places will be the hub of the government of God. You know, the name Jerusalem is such uh, an enigma because Jerusalem means possession of peace. And that city's never known peace. It's been one of the most embattled cities in the world. 28 times Jerusalem has been burnt to the ground. You know why? Because the devil is smart enough to know the destiny of that city. And he knows that city is ordained to be the throne city of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that the government of God restoring an Eden, a pristine paradise atmosphere on this earth is going to be centered there in Jerusalem. And so again and again and again he attacks that city to try and stop the inevitable. But that's exactly what it is. It is inevitable. Jesus will reign in Jerusalem, and we're going to reign with him. I said, we're going to reign with him, saints of God. And I know some people a little bit taken aback by that. They think, well, I, I, I hardly can do what needs to be done in my own life, pay my trailer payment, get my car payment paid, take care of my heating bill, my uh, this bill, how can I reign over the earth as a king with the Lord Jesus Christ? The same way an acorn can grow into an oak tree. You cannot compare the oak tree to the acorn it came out of, and you cannot compare a glorified saint with the humble beginnings of being a human being like the rest of us. Amen to that. Number 12, the 12th blessing of Abraham is covenant. 
Covenant, one of my favorite subjects. Most of you know that because you went through 24 weeks of studying covenants here with me. And we're going to go into that again very soon. What is a covenant? Please read the definition out loud with me from your outline. A covenant is a formal, solemn, and binding agreement between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. When you come into the revelation and the realization that you are in covenant with God, you become an unstoppable, unconquerable person. Depression goes out the window. Oh, you may have depressing circumstances you face in life, but when you really realize what covenant means, see, when you're in covenant with a fellow human being, that means your partners through everything you pass through in life. And if that person goes through a hard time, you run to their rescue. If you go through a hard time, that person runs to your rescue. My burdens become his burdens. His burdens become my burdens. My battles become his battles. His battles become my battles. If I have abundance, I share it with him. If he has abundance, he shares it with me. We're in covenant with one another. And it's so also with regard to the relationship we have with God. In fact, would you lift your voice right now and tell him, my battles are your battles, Lord. My burdens are your burdens. My abundance is your abundance. Everything I'm blessed with belongs to you. Praise God. But the flip side is true also. Not only are your battles his battles, his battle is your battle. His burden is your burden. What is his burden? A lost human race. What is his battle? The reacquisition of this planet, taking it back for the kingdom of God. And you and I have got to be soldiers on the front line. We've got to be people of great commitment to the battle until it's won. When will we know it's won? When every single person in the world is baptized and knows the Lord Jesus. Praise God. We've got a job to do, saints. From 1990 to the year 2000, Christianity only grew 5% in the United States of America. Simultaneously, New Age spirituality that teaches all religions as different paths to God grew 240%. If those figures continue unabated into the future, we will lose our country. We have got to each be of an Elijah-like mindset. Not in a prideful way, not in an egotistical way. But Elijah said, Lord, they've forsaken your covenant. They've worshiped other gods, and I, even I, alone am left. And God said, no, I've reserved 7,000 men that have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. But he had this mindset that he had to pray as if he was the one the whole plan of God was hinged on. He had to prophesy, he had to preach, he had to live like the whole plan of God hinged on him. And I think we should all have that mindset of sharing that kind of responsibility that's part of covenant. Now, uh, the old covenant uh, is a general term that covers the first seven covenants. You had two covenants with Adam, the covenant of creation and the covenant of redemption. Then you have the Noahic covenant, which was made with all of the seed of Noah and all of the animals that were in the ark. Strangely, that filters down to every person in the world. So every human being in the world is actually in covenant with God, though many of them, most of them, I would say, have broken that covenant in many ways. But there's a certain covenantal element that stems down from Noah. And then you have the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the promised land covenant that was made with the children of Israel in the wilderness, the Davidic covenant, the covenant God made with David, and then the eighth covenant is the new covenant. So seven covenants make up the old covenant that was not sufficient because it did not change man internally. And then after seven comes the eighth covenant. Why the eighth? I think God chose it that way on purpose because eight is the number of new beginnings and this covenant is all about new beginnings. <laughs> it's about having a new beginning every single day because he said the outward man perishes but the inward man is renewed day by day which means to be made brand new all over again. That's only possible through the blood of Jesus to be made brand new all over again every single day. Isn't that awesome? The eighth note in a scale is the beginning of a new scale of, of seven notes. Uh, the eighth day is the beginning of a new week. It's a new beginning. And in like manner, the eighth covenant is a new beginning for every one of us. We become new creations in Christ Jesus. We have a new spirit. God didn't just take the old spirit that was messed up and try to put some spiritual band-aids on it. 
He said, I will put a new spirit in you, a brand new spirit. It comes from God. It comes from New Jerusalem, the mother of us all. And uh, somehow at the moment of salvation, the old spirit is extricated right out of us and a new spirit is infused into us and we become a brand new creature in Christ Jesus, new creation with a new name and newness of life is something we can walk in. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's good news. Now I quote Hebrews chapter 10 verses 16 and 17 here. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, that I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's two major facets of the new covenant. And that's actually quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, where God forecast what the new covenant would be about. He said, you shall no more call every man his neighbor and uh, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So personal, intimate knowledge with God is the first facet of the new covenant. Secondly, God writing his law, engraving, not just writing like we would write with a pen on paper, but engraving so that it becomes inseparably a part of us. No wonder you want to live right. God engraved his law into your heart and into your mind. Your emotions and your intellect have both received this, this infusing, this integration of God's laws into your nature. It's the only way it'll work. It didn't work the old covenant way. And then I love the last scripture I give you on covenant. Jeremiah 33, verses 20 and 21. Of all the covenant scriptures I've quoted in the many years I've been preaching on covenant, this is my favorite of all passages. This was actually God affirming his covenant with David. Now I want you to imagine the intensity of this promise. God says, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, that there be no more day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. In other words, God is saying, you'll have to shut down the solar system. You'll have to somehow destroy the whole order of the solar system before you can destroy the covenant relationship I have with David and the covenant relationship I have with my priests. And by the way, you qualify under the new will as Levitical priests. You are all a royal priesthood and you are all a holy priesthood. And God says in essence, yeah, the devil may be fighting you. Sure, demons may be strategizing against you. Sure, people may persecute you. But God is saying, before they overcome you, let them try and prevent the sun from coming up tomorrow morning. If they can do that, then they can stop you. And if I was you, I'd give God a praise right now. I would really give him a praise. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. You talk about confidence building. If you want to study a subject in God's word that will do it, study covenant. All right, number 13, we're winding up this revelation of the blessings of Abraham. God said, I give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. You know, you should do some research. I, I, I would like to be able to take enough time to show you exactly the territory that was originally promised to Abraham. And the Jewish people, the Israelite people have never possessed all the land that God promised in all the wars, in all the battles, even David never got the outer extremity of the property that was promised to Abraham because I believe that's been reserved for the kingdom age yet to come because God over and over again emphasizes that what we cannot do in the flesh, he can do with one sweep of his hand supernaturally. When he comes again, I believe that land will fall in the proper uh, control. And uh, just like God said in the beginning. But according to Romans chapter 4, verse 13, please read this one out loud with me. It says, and this is the Revised Standard Version, by the way. It says, the promise to Abraham and his descendants that they should inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Two important elements there. First of all, they didn't get the inheritance because they earned it with works. They got the inheritance because they believed what God said. 
which is elemental. <laughs> That's, uh, the foundation is faith toward God. That's the second one in the list of six in Hebrews chapter uh, six. Uh, he said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And so faith is elemental. And if you believe, you inherit the world. That's a really nice arrangement, isn't it? I wish it was that easy just to get enough money to pay your bills. Wouldn't it be nice? Uh, but I give you a bunch of scriptures, mostly from Psalm 37, which emphasizes this Abrahamic blessing of inheriting the world. And uh, he didn't just inherit the land of promise. He inherited the whole world according to certain. I, I give you a number of scriptures there. And the ones with an asterisk imply a global inheritance, not just the land of promise. But uh, Psalm 39, verses 9, 11, 22, 29, and 34. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. And then finally, Jesus capping it off with his statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek. Say it with me. Come on, everybody. You know it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Do you see the utter mystery of that statement? Because all the great armies and all the great conquerors that have tried to, uh, to achieve global dominance did it by aggressiveness, they did it by violence, and God is saying the absolute opposite to that is what's going to work. Those that live by the sword must die by the sword. But the meek, and that word meek means quick to submit to God and quick to forgive others. It's both vertical and horizontal. If you're meek, it doesn't take long for you to say, I surrender, Lord. And it doesn't take long for you to say, they've hurt me deeply, but I forgive them. And God says, you are my candidates for world domination. Isn't that awesome? So it's not just Abraham, it's you that believe. Number 14, and this is a powerful one. He said, your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Say that with me, please. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. That's found in Genesis 22:17. 17. That's part of the blessing of Abraham that was revealed right after he offered up Isaac on Mount Moriah. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now, in the New Testament writing, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it implied when it says, Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, that it was a reference to singular, the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ. But other versions make it plural. And so it's questionable whether or not it was a reverence just to Jesus who would uh, possess the gate of his enemies or a promise it would pass to all of us. And I tend to believe it passed to all of us and, and that the New King James Version is right. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Well, what does that mean to possess the gate of your enemy? That doesn't mean when the enemy attacks you, you win. It means when you attack the enemy, the enemy cannot withstand your force and your power and your authority. You come to the gate of the enemy, you knock that gate down, you bind on earth and it's bound in heaven, you loose on earth and it's loosed in heaven. It's not being on the defensive, it's being on the offensive. And uh, what is the gate of your enemy anyway? Think about that. If you were to itemize, if you were to define the gate of your enemy, what would you define the gate of the enemy as? Well, the gate is the, is the way you exit from a stronghold, right? And so the enemy has a, a goal of building a stronghold in people's lives. A stronghold can be just a, like a monument of negativity inside of a person's intellect. The Bible talks about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. And it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then it talks about areas of negative thinking. I've heard some people call it stinking thinking, where 
you're, you're full of uh, self-condemning attitudes or depression over the past or fear of the future. I uh, missed God 20 years ago, so I'll never be able to do anything significant with my life again. That's a lie. That's a lie. God always has a second plan in place. And uh, plenty of people have blown it the first time around, and then God gives them an alternative route that brings forth as much or more fruit. So don't let the enemy build a stronghold of negativity in your mind. And the gate of the enemy, if the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, is any passageway through which the enemy, the devil and his demonic underlings, can enter into your life to wreak havoc and chaos and death. It may th be through a certain kind of thought process, certain kind of temptation, certain kind of demonic influence that you're vulnerable to. They pass through that gate to try and bring death into your life. Jesus said, that's not going to happen for you. If you believe and if you receive to the degree you should, he said, you're going to possess the gate of your enemies. In other words, bring it under control. Possess your possessions. Uh, possess your, your uh, vessel in sanctification and honor, the Bible says. And also I give you Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 here. This is the culmination of Jesus' conversation with Peter where he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Mashiach, the son of the living God. And he said to Peter, I say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. What's he talking about? What rock? He wasn't talking about Peter. Back up and see the rest of it. He said, uh, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're that great prophet risen from the dead. But who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar, Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. No one religiously coerced you into believing I am the Messiah. No one filled your mind with it. It came direct from God. And then he said, on this rock, everybody say this rock, I will build my church. What rock? The rock of divine revelation. If you've just been philosophically persuaded that Jesus is the way to heaven, that doesn't carry much strength in the time of pressure. But if you've had a revelation of the Messiahship of Jesus, let all the world turn against you. You'll stand your ground. Praise God. Praise God. I say unto you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, uh, this is the modern King James Version where it's translated hell. Actually, that's not completely a communication of what the original is saying. Because the original Greek word was Hades. And Hades is the uh, equivalent of Sheol. And Sheol, the Hebrew word, is the underworld. The gates of Sheol will not prevail against my church. The gates of Sheol meant the, the underworld, not only spiritually, but naturally, where the body goes at death down into the ground, and then the soul either passed to the chamber of the wicked or the chamber of the righteous, which was Abraham's bosom prior to the cross. And uh, so it was the realm of the dead and everything that, that uh, happened as a result of death. But he says, my church is not to be intimidated. My church is not to be fearful. Because the gates of death, the gates of hell, the gates of Sheol cannot prevail against my church. Why? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I believe you ought to shout unto God in the house. Hallelujah. Blessing number 15. We're coming around the home stretch now. Fifteenth blessing of Abraham in the 16 that passed to us, if we believe like Abraham believed, is righteousness. Now, Genesis 15, verse 6 is where I'm quoting, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. What did he believe? He believed that God could take a dead womb like Sarah's and bring forth life. God said, even though she was barren, he believed that God could, in a sense, quicken her womb back to life in order to be childbearing. Uh, in order to bring forth a child, even as God promised. So he had to believe that God would bring something dead to life, and God counted it to him for righteousness. It's like he deposited faith in the bank of heaven and withdrew righteousness. Get that in your thinking. He deposited faith and withdrew righteousness. Well, the same thing happened over in Genesis 22 when he offered up Isaac. 
He knew that God had said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. And now God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. So he believed even if he sacrificed him that God would raise him from the dead. And once again, God counted it to him for righteousness. Whenever that blessing came, it was when he believed that something dead, God could take hold of and bring back to life. Well, the same thing has happened to you. How many believe Jesus was dead, but he's alive forevermore? Amen. You believe he was dead, but God brought him back to life. And if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. In the new covenant, righteousness is something you believe your way into because you believe God conquered death and raised Jesus up. Hallelujah. That's our blessing. And uh, Romans 4, verses 2 and 3 says, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. So he became righteous in the sight of heaven before he had time to do any religious works that would make him righteous. In other words, it was a gift. It was a gift. And we've already covered Romans, Romans 5, 17. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And finally, when the bride of Christ is in the full spectacular glory of her heavenly garment, Revelation 19.8 says, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We know something about linen, and I've only got a few minutes here, and I've got to finish up quickly, but fine linen has two directions of threads. You have vertical threads and horizontal threads. If you only have vertical threads, which is the imparted righteousness, then uh, you better not walk too much because those threads can move and expose every part of your body. And if all you had was horizontal threads, they'd drop around your feet and... You would not be clothed very long. But when you weave them together, you've got a garment of righteousness. And horizontal is the works of righteousness with which you respond to God. I believe you have to have both to have the garment of righteousness that the bride of Christ will be clothed with. And that's why God said, sow to yourself in righteousness and reap in mercy until he come and rain righteousness down on you. So in other words, you be as righteous as you can be within yourself. That's the horizontal threads. And then he'll rain righteousness down on you to perfection, and that's the vertical threads. And weave them together, and you've got a robe of righteousness to wear forever. Praise God. Finally, 16. The 16th blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham that came on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ is the promise of the Spirit through faith. Oh, I am so thankful for the day when God poured his Holy Spirit into my life and brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light, I'm going to show forth his praises forever. And uh, it's called the promise of the Father. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, we've got to balance out in the last two or three minutes that I've got in this lesson We've got to balance out this whole idea of faith versus works. You know, there's a divine tension with every single major doctrine in the Bible. You've got the triune nature of God and the oneness of God. These three are one. You've got grace and opposing grace. You've got law. You've got faith. And on the opposite extreme, you've got works. And you can't divorce yourself from either extreme. Truth is always found in the middle of two extremes. And the whole issue about Abraham is faith, faith, faith. We walk in faith and therefore we're blessed with faithful Abraham. But we've got a qualifying scripture in James. And I've heard some theologians say that James's epistle shouldn't even be in the New Testament because he throws some rods in, in this faith thinking that Paul um, uh, so emphasized. But I believe he brought balance to it. 
So let's read James chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. Can we read it out loud? But will you know, O vain man, and by the way, James was some kind of writer. He'd refer to people as, O oh, vain people, O oh, adulterers and adulteresses. And then he'd say, my beloved. <laughs> he had a way of smoothing it over. But anyway, but will you know, O vain man, let's continue, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see how faith worked with his works? And from the works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You miss, well, that doesn't... That, that, that disconnects with Paul's teaching. No, it completes Paul's teaching. Because yes, you're saved by faith and not by works. Because uh, by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourself. Not of works lest any man should boast. So it's not your works that save you. But it's your works that are proof that you truly did get saved. See, and uh, the presence of works. And when I say works, I'm not talking about religious Ceremonial works, traditional works. I'm talking about works that are the product of divine inspiration in your life. Works that are the product of divine influence in your life. Works that are the product of divine transformation in your life. And when you see someone really walk with a transformed character, then you know that they connected with the God who brought forth that transformation. They prove it through works that they got something through faith. Does that make sense? And it becomes the evidence that you truly had faith in your life. And when Abraham departed his homeland, that was a work that proved he really had faith in the spoken word that he received. When he offered Isaac up on the altar, that was proof that he really responded by faith to what God demanded. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 39, when he was being withstood by some of the religious authorities that, that demanded some type of... Uh, proof from him. He had the right and the authority to say what he said. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus answered them and said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And what were the main works of Abraham? Leaving familiar surroundings, taking the risk of stepping out into a life where there was no promise of any future help, really. He just had to follow God and offering everything he'd ever lived for for 25 years on an altar to God, Isaac. Those are the same kind of works God may demand to us, of us, self-denial, obedience, and sacrifice. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Praise God. But brothers, we like Isaac are children of promise. And if we are children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, the next thing we are is children of promise, just like Isaac was. Promises brought us forth supernaturally to be the sons and daughters of God that we are. Well, I hope that was a great blessing to you, learning what it is to be children of Abraham. And we really just skim the surface. It's a deep, deep subject. And I think uh, one of the things it does, it gives us a sense of our Abrahamic roots, which is something God's doing in the last days. He's making the Gentile portion of the truth uh, the Gentile portion of the church understand their affinity with the patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, 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 and they're understanding more and more that when a Jew accepts Jesus as the Messiah, they don't become a Christian. When we accept Jesus as the Messiah, the Mashiach, we are grafted into Israel. So we have to understand and appreciate our Abrahamic roots. And also they have to understand and appreciate the Messiahship of Jesus. And I believe there will be a coming together of the true church and Israel in the last days. And that's how God's going to do it. So praise God. Father, we thank you for this study. And we thank you for burning into our hearts the part of it that is personal to us. And just let it become explosive in praise and adoration in our lives. In Jesus' name.